How's it going, ladies and gentlemen? Mr. Donahue here again. This time we're going to take a look at the molecular orbitals of second row diatomic molecules. So our objectives will be to accurately create molecular orbital diagrams for second row diatomic molecules. So second row diatomic molecules. What's all the hubbub, right? What's different about the second row versus the first? Well, in that second row, the 2s and the 2p orbitals are a thing. Instead of just 1s, we also have 2s, but more significantly, the p orbitals are a thing. So what's the same? Well, the number of molecular orbitals is equal to the number of atomic orbitals combined. That's still the same. Atomic orbitals combine best with other atomic orbitals of similar energy, meaning that when the s and the s uh, combine, that's better. The p and the p combining together, that's best. But s combining with the p, not as good. So the more overlap we get, the more effective bonding we have, and the lower the molecular orbital energy. That's also still true. As well as each molecular orbital can hold two electrons with opposite spins, you know, Pauli's exclusion principle. And uh, when molecular orbitals are being filled, one electron goes into each molecular orbital with the same energy before pairing of the electrons. Hun's rule, that's still the same. So let's take a look at Li2, lithium molecule. So the electron configuration for lithium is 1s2, 2s1. So if we take a look, the 1s orbitals make molecular orbitals in the same way that H2 did, right? They combine, we end up with a bonding orbital and an anti-bonding orbital. And then you fill in the electrons just like you did. Uh, and then the 2s orbital mix in the same way. But notice there's a little bit of a difference between the 2s combination and the 1s combination. Because the 2s orbitals are larger, they can overlap more than the 1s orbitals do. So that means, you know, because they're larger and further away from the nucleus, you get more overlap and there's a greater drop in energy for the sigma 2s than the sigma 1s. So if you take a look, like here would be this atomic orbital energy, there's a bigger drop in energy than in the 1s combination. So again, bond order, same process as before. It's one half times the bonding electrons minus the anti-bonding electrons. So for lithium, we have a total of four bonding electrons and two anti-bonding electrons. So one half of four minus two gives us one. So special note, the core electrons, in this example, the 1s2, fill the bonding and anti-bonding molecular orbitals, effectively canceling, canceling each other out. So basically, we can ignore the core electrons when we're trying to figure out the bond order and whatnot. So if we did that, the math would be, all right, well, let's ignore the core electrons with what's going on with the first energy level and just focus on the valence shell. Well, we end up with the same bond order. We get two bonding electrons minus zero antibondings. One half of that is one. So from here on out, we can kind of ignore that, right? So BE2, right? Let's ignore those 1s2 electrons. Like we said, they're going to fill the bonding and antibonding, negating each other. So draw the atomic orbitals, draw the molecular orbitals, fill in the electrons, right? So 2s2. All right, now same process. One, two, three, four. That's all my electrons. The bond order is zero for BE2. BE2 does not exist. You're not going to find a BE2 molecule. All right. So now we're getting into the P orbitals, right? So what do the molecular orbitals look like from the P orbitals combining, P atomic orbitals? Well, we know, you know, I, we have three P orbitals. We generally call them like X, Y, and Z. Uh, so let's take a look at these, these yellow ones. They can overlap head to head. So if I take these two P orbitals and I overlap them, I can end up with two molecular orbitals. One, where they overlap and kind of bloop together and one where they're repelling each other. And I end up with like a node in between the two nuclei. So we call this the Sigma 2P and the Sigma star 2P. Again, it's Sigma because it's along the internuclear axis still. And we made them from the 2P electrons, the 2P orbitals. So, all right, so I have these P orbitals as well and they can add side to side. I can form a bonding molecular orbital by having them overlap above and below that nucleus. Now, since it's not along the internuclear axis, it's a pi orbital, right? Sigma's along in between those two nuclei. If it's not in that internuclear axis, we, it's a pi. So I made 
pi 2p molecular orbital there bonding and also well they can repel each other right so this would be the pi star 2p molecular orbital they're repelling each other again i end up with a node in between the two nuclei and then i have another set of p atomic orbitals and they can combine kind of side to side so they can bloop together and overlap again this would be a pi 2p because it's not in between the two nuclei it's to the left and to the right of them or they can repel each other which i have a hard time illustrating but this is it right so same thing it was doing with the other one but instead of above and below now it's left and right so if i take a look at all the different molecular orbitals from 2p atomic orbitals this is what they look like now some of these are degenerate meaning that they're the same energy so if i take a look at those pi molecular orbitals the bonding ones are degenerate they're the same energy as the other one and that's also true for the anti-bonding molecular orbitals so if i take a look at the ones that i got the pi uh, 2p anti-bonding ones the pi star 2p they're also degenerate with each other they have the same energy as each other so what is my molecular orbitals going to look like all right well it's going to look like this right i have these p orbitals combining to give me molecular orbitals and yeah remember i said these two were degenerate so they're going to be side by side because of their same energy and uh same with the anti-bonding ones they're going to be side by side as well so we're going to start to get molecular orbital diagrams that are a little more complicated so for boron carbon and nitrogen this is going to be the structure that it looks like uh again the illustrations are just to show you what they look like they will, will just be boxes and now for oxygen right all right so we're going to focus on this region right this region is going to change a little bit and it's kind of obnoxious so in this example the pi 2p bonding molecular orbitals are lower energy than the sigma 2p bonding orbitals so you know you end up with two on the bottom and then one on top when we look at the other second row diatomic molecules like with oxygen fluorine and neon we have a slightly different structure here we have one on bottom and two on top right so the sigma 2p here is lower energy than the pi 2p molecular orbitals so yeah at this point you're probably thinking why can't anything in chemistry be easy why do we have this obnoxiousness all right well let me boil it down for you what you need to know what you need to know is when you use each structure so you need to know that for boron carbon and nitrogen it's got to be looking like this and for oxygen fluorine and neon it's got to be looking like this so you just need to know that you need to know that the reason there's a difference in structure is because the 2p and the 2s orbitals interact right so we have the s orbitals but we also have these p orbitals and they're kind of interacting with each other too you don't really need to know too much just know that the larger interactions are for boron carbon and nitrogen and the smaller interactions are for oxygen fluorine and neon but really the big takeaway is this one you need to know when to use which structure so let's take a look at boron b2 molecule so again you can ignore the first energy level electrons create the molecular orbital diagrams uh place the electron so it's 2s2 2p1 looks like that and then same thing just start placing the electrons till you're all done remember that since these are degenerate they have the same energy you're going to put one in each box before you pair them up all right so that you get something that looks like this bond order for this would be one right we have four bonding electrons and two anti-bonding electrons so one half of four minus two gives me one c2 same process all right this is its electron configuration let me place the electrons it's 2s2 2p2 all right and i got these molecular orbitals now i just need to place all of those electrons right so i gotta put I just, all right i got two four up down up down and then i gotta place four electrons up up down down and now what would the bond order for this be well let's see i have two for six bonding electrons and two anti-bonding electrons so it would give me a bond order of two nitrogen 
bond or electron configuration 2s2 2p3 so again place the the atomic electrons write out its notation now you go all right well i got to place all of these electrons into the molecular orbitals so i go all right up down one two three four five six seven eight nine ten awesome so i've placed all my electrons now the well, bond order is going to be well let's see we got two plus two four six i have eight bonding electrons and two anti-bonding electrons so when i do the math one half of eight minus two gives me three n2 has a bond order of three now o2 watch remember the uh the structure changed right so the molecular orbital structure changed this is now one on the bottom and two up top right here same process though 2s2 2p4 so i place all the electrons i go all right that based on the configuration this is what i'm working with now I got to place all those electrons into my molecular orbitals. So I got 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12. So now what would my bond order be? Well, I have 2 plus 6. I have 8 bonding electrons and I have 4 anti-bonding electrons. So my bond order is going to be 2. And hey, wouldn't you know it? I know O2 molecule. I'm really familiar with that. It has a double bond. Awesome. Consistent with what I already know about oxygen. F2, same process. 2s2, 2p5. Draw in those electrons. And go, all right, well, I have to place all of these electrons now into my molecular orbitals. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10. And you go, all right, well, what would my bond order be? I have 2 plus 6 more, so i got 8 bonding electrons, and I have 6 anti-bonding electrons. So bond order would be one half of eight minus six gives me a bond order of one. Hey, I know that's true for fluorine already. Awesome, it's consistent with what I know. Now, Ne2, same process, place all the electrons, fill in the molecular orbitals, and then watch what happens. What's the bond order gonna be for neon? It's, it's a noble gas, so Ne2, let me see, I got, you know, let me count them, two plus, I got eight bonding electrons and I have eight non-antibonding electrons. So my bond order would be zero. And once you know it, I know neon's noble gas. It doesn't like forming molecules. It doesn't bond to other things. Beautiful. So a quick note about heteronuclear diatomic molecules. If you want to sound super fancy, just talk about heteronuclear diatomic molecules with your friends, right? Hetero means different. Nuclear means nuclei. Di means two, atomic means atom. So we're talking about things that have different nuclei. We've been talking about in the past, homonuclear diatomic molecules, which means the same nuclei for two atoms making a molecule. Now we're gonna look at heteronuclear diatomic molecules, which just means we got two different nuclei, but it's still two atoms bonding together to make atoms. So an example we're gonna look at is NO, the NO molecule. So the 2s orbitals of different elements have different energies, right? If you take a look at nitrogen's 2s orbital, it's a slightly higher energy than oxygen's 2s orbital. So they, they're not starting off at the same place, but if they are similar enough, we can treat them in the same way we did homonuclear diatomic molecules. So even though they're not the same, they're close enough that we can treat them as if they were the same. Now, the 2p atomic orbitals also have that same difference in energy. You can see oxygen's 2p orbitals are lower energy than nitrogen's, but they're close enough that we're going to treat them as if they were the same. So the NO molecule, why did we pick this one as an example? Well, NO is important biologically. It's involved in memory, relaxing of muscles, as well as killing foreign cells. So we're interested in this molecule. Uh, and the Lewis structure suggests a double bond. Right? When we draw the two possible Lewis structures, there's a double bond there. But when we observe the actual structure of the NO molecule, it's a shorter bond length, which suggests it should be more than just a double bond. Interesting. So let's use the molecular orbital theory to better explain the actual structure. So again, same kind of process, right? Yeah, it's... Yeah, yeah draw out the electrons, you fill in the molecular orbitals, and then let's take a look at the bond order, right? So the bond order for the NO molecule, well, we have two plus six, we have eight bonding, and we have two plus one anti-bonding. 
So I have three anti-bonding. My bond order is two and a half. Remember I told you bond orders can be fractions. That's fine. And the bond order of two and a half agrees with what we've seen about the bond length of the NO molecule. So the molecular orbital theory is going to be the better one to use to explain the structure of this molecule as opposed to the Lewis structure. So to summarize, can you accurately create molecular orbital diagrams for second row diatomic molecules? I hope so. Goodbye.